Are you doing what Jesus tells you to do for your marriage? Good morning, everyone. This is our reflection question for today. Patrick Cooney narrates, I have worn two wedding bands for more than a dozen years. The rings seldom get noticed, but when I am asked about them, I respond. I have two wives, an answer that is met with a chuckle, a groan, or a weird look. Recently, after leading a business meeting, I stopped in the hallway to check text messages on my phone. As I was typing, a stranger paused and inquired, Why are you wearing two wedding bands? I have two wives, I said. This time, there was no chuckle or groan. No, really, he said. Why? I explained that I'd lost my father in 1999, shortly before the turn of the century, something he was really looking forward to experiencing. As we were saying our final farewells at his funeral, my mother, his wife of 50 plus years, removed his wedding band and handed it to me. Surprised, I placed the gold band on my left middle finger next to my wedding band. There it has remained. I told the stranger that I wear my father's wedding band to honor my father and my parents' marriage. I also wear it to remind myself to be the son, brother, husband, and dad that my father wanted me to be. I'm now 60 years old and have been married for 30 years. The stranger nodded and without a word, turned and walked down the stairs to the parking lot. I returned to my mobile phone and messages. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the stranger walking back toward me. He said, Sir, you know, I have my father's wedding band in my sock drawer at home. And beginning today, I am going to start wearing it. I silently nodded and the stranger quietly turned and walked back down to the parking lot. And I smiled. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus, Mary, and some disciples were invited to a wedding. For the Gospel of John, this wedding in Cana signals the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, a happy setting. The ending of his public ministry before his passion, for the Gospel of John, in contrast, is the death of Lazarus, brother of Mary and Martha, from a happy start to a hapless ending, from a feeling of gain to a sense of grief. We take note of that minor detail from the book of John. It bears, though, resemblance to our marriages. Marriages begin with a joyful run but risks falling into the ravine of misery. Indeed, from wedding ring to suffering. At many points, the joy becomes a jostle of two unique individuals who face the many realities of life together. Each may have a different response as they look through the lens of their own individual experiences from childhood to the present, and this may result in clashes. That is why we are made to promise during our wedding to remain as one through thick and thin, through fit and fat, through zips and sags, yes, sags with an S. But even such a promise is no security of a marriage for keeps, for the cruel environment around us may zap the energy out of us. We can age gracefully together as a couple with large doses of daily smiles, thank yous, I love yous, and I'm sorry's. Or we can coexist in an abode full of small irritations that grow into deep hurts, incessant tears and pain permanently etched on our faces, a meaningless cohabitation with a spouse turned stranger. As a husband, you must look at your wife today as beautiful as on the day of the wedding, even with the extra poundage gain. You must remember and appreciate that she carried in her womb for nine months every child that she gifted you with. That's why they're called love handles. Every child was a product of her love for you. As a wife, the receding hairline and gradual baldness of your husband is a sign of years of figuratively pulling his hair to provide for you and the family. And the pot belly is his wheelbarrow of stress doing so. Allow him to lead the family with your support and respect. Grace needs to enter and remain in our marriages to keep our marriage glued, intact, and flourishing all throughout. But grace can only be had at our insistence. God will not interfere nor insert himself in our affairs if we don't want to. If there is a third party we must allow in our marriages, it is God and no other. We reflect on the words of our Blessed Mother as our anchor to prevent our marriages from disintegrating. Do whatever he tells you, Mama Mary said. Yes, indeed, we need to do as our Father in Heaven tells us to immerse ourselves in Jesus together in prayer, in prayer alone, in prayer all the time, and ask that our marriages be made holy. Our words and our actions should be fully aligned to His commandment of love, 
unconditional and sacrificial, we must respond with Yes, Lord, when He tells us to fill the containers of our marriage with the waters of our faith so that His grace may convert it into His life-giving blood running through our veins, stabbing off boredom, indifference, resentment, unforgiveness, and the resulting infidelity. When we honor His invitation to do what He tells us, we become the husband and wife, the father and mother, the brother and sister, the in-laws that He desires us to be, a complete package and a desirable, beautiful and holy gift to one another in our marriage. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, keep my marriage and all the marriages out there obedient to your will of faithfulness to one another and faithfulness to you. Make me a holy spouse. This I pray in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless your families, brothers and sisters. God bless our Catholic faith and couples for Christ.